Ah, good morning, good morning. Hallelujah, God is good. Hey, open your Bibles, Galatians chapter 5, as we uh, continue on here in our series. You know, I tell you, um, I've said this before, I'm still amazed. I just, I felt the Holy Spirit drawn us to this book of Galatians after we finished the book of John. And um, again, you can go through this pretty quickly because the themes are pretty simple here. Um, you know, Paul is basically laying this track of, look, you've been called out from underneath the legalism of the law. Why would you want to go back to it? The Judaizers came out of Jerusalem and they had persuaded the churches after Paul had established them that they needed the law of Moses. Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. They needed to receive the blessings of Abraham through Jesus and through the observance of and following their religious traditions and the law of Moses. And he literally says, you know, um, in verse 7, if you go to chapter 5 back up, he said, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Literally, he was. He started to call them out. We, we know it was the Judaizers, Judaizers, but then who is the name? Give me the name. Who is it? Call them out. Call it for what it is. And we were so encouraged by that. Because we had an altar call that day, and, and it was basically, look, there's some stumbling block in your life. What is it? Who is it? Call it out. Put it under the blood. Verse 8, he says, persuasion did not come from him who calls you. In other words, the persuasion that they were going through, the problems that they had, it was, it was from, it didn't come from the Bible. In other words, it's, this is not from the Word of God. This didn't come from the Word of God, this persuasion, this stumbling block this dynamic of, you know, uh, what the Judaizers were pouring upon them. And then he says this, and he's talking right in their language. We saw this last week, but it, but it sets the stage. A little leaven leavens a whole lump of dough. In other words, one little lie, one little lie, this lie of circumcision can, can create a whole mis- concept of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You have to remember that. It is all about the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And man, I tell you, we I know the Holy Spirit has pounded this into us, and it might seem a little repetitive, and you all have been very gracious, but listen, listen, listen. It is about the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You don't add anything to that work. We saw this last Sunday when Adam and Eve sinned, and I think it's worth repeating, repeating, the sinful nature of them, God took the sinful nature of the fall of the first at, uh, man and woman, and he imputed that to us, and there, therefore we were all born into a sin nature. When God then came to earth through Jesus Christ, as the perfect Adam, as the second Adam, as the, as the perfection of humanity, God clothed, Emmanuel, God with us, when he came and lived that sinless life, died on the cross, when we accept him, literally when God came to earth in Christ, he brought the righteousness of God back that Adam had before he fell. And so through Christ on the cross, he takes the righteousness, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the righteousness of God that Adam had in the garden that was taken from him through his, through his sinful nature, fall, literally is imputed back to us and that sin nature of Adam is laid on Jesus Christ on the cross. It's, it's amazing. It's a simple truth, but it's a powerful truth. Folks, um, John 8, um, John eight thirty six. when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Think about that. He said in verse 10, quickly, I have confidence in you in the Lord. In other words, I have confidence that being led by the Spirit, no longer a slave, now an heir, a son, with the Spirit of Sonship, with the Holy Spirit in you, that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. In other words, I was a Pharisee. If I now went back to her, if I still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? You know I'm being persecuted for it. goes back to their message. It's a lie. This addition to the work of Christ was a lie. 
Verse 12, and then we'll move on for today. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. And this was a powerful thought. I believe what Paul is saying right here is this. It's not basically, although he did say back here in chapter 1, if anyone preaches a different message other than the one I brought to you, right? Remember that? Um, let him be accursed in, in chapter 1, verse 8. Even if, but, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what I have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Accursed literally means be to damned. But here when Paul says, these guys that are preaching circumcision as the sign, as the addition to the cross, I wish that they would totally emasculate themselves. In other words, I wish that, and here's what he's saying, not only would they cut off the sign, I'm not trying to be gross, but get the, get the point here. Not only would they cut off the sign, but they would cut off everything so that it could not, so that their lie could not procreate into the next generation. In other words, that they would become eunuchs, literally cut off, sterile, that that lie would not jump into another generation. Man, how powerful. All right. Now today, verse 13, watch this. Because again, remember, the subtitles, the chapters, the verses were added. This is one continuous thought of Paul, yet we break it down into chunks for the sake of teaching. Here we go. Verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You were called to freedom. Here's what he's saying. When the Spirit of God came, when Jesus Christ came as the new covenant in his blood, he fulfilled all the old covenant. Remember, the old covenant could never save you. All it could do was condemn you. The law, Paul literally told us, was then the tutor. He said that back here, the intent of the law. In chapter 3, verse 19, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come through whom the promise had been made. In other words, it was just added. It was just... It was, a, it was a tutor. It was a schoolmaster. It was to show you you're sinful. It was to show you that what you're doing wrong. It was legalism, literally. It was the legalism of God showing you what was wrong so that you could be and would be condemned or shown your sinfulness that you would then understand that you can't save yourself because there was nothing, there was no provision within the law to save yourself, right? Right? So he said, you were called to freedom. You were called out from under that. You're no longer a slave. You're a son. You were called out from underneath that law into freedom. But here's what he says. Don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. So here's kind of the, there's an elephant in the room here. Here's what's going on. They were called, and as Paul said, circumcision or no circumcision, it's, it's, it's irrelevant if they're trying to add anything to that. But here's the elephant in the room. The, the argument is, well, Paul, how can anybody follow law or follow God if they don't have rules and regulations? In other words, who's going to tell us what to do? How, do? how do we know what to do? If we don't follow the Ten Commandments, right? If we don't, if we don't follow the law, then we're not going to law, we're not going to know where the law is going to take us or, or what we're going to do in life or how we're going to do that. Does that make sense? So that was kind of the thing. And I'm sure that that was, was the argument because, you know, they went to the Ten Commandments, right? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. Well, Paul, if we don't have that, the law, then, then how are we going to obey? Who's going to tell us what to do? How are we going to know what to do? How are we going to know what to live by? Here's Paul's argument, and this is where this letter is coming. You're out, you're free, you've been called to freedom, but don't turn into a psycho. It doesn't mean you can do anything you want because of the grace of God. This is a problem for us today, and we kind of mentioned this last Sunday. Look, some people, they, they take the grace of God as just a license to do whatever because God knows my heart. So they just live their lives and go, well, God knows my heart. No, you're called to freedom, but not 
freedom to be a free agent on the world. No, you're called to freedom out of the law, right? The condemning law into freedom. But watch what he says, right? It's going to be all about this living by the Spirit. We're going to see that in just a minute. Look at verse um, 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now think about this. When they were called out from under the law, Paul said this in Romans 8, 1 and 2, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, the law is not there telling you you're a sinfulness. You're showing you your sinfulness or calling you a sinner. There's there's no there's now no no longer any common or uh, condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And this really states it right here. He says in, in Romans 8 verse 2, for the law of the spirit for the law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. That really tells you. The law of sin and death literally says, look, you, you're a sinner. You, you'll never be right. You have to sacrifice. You have to atone. You have to do all these things. But it never, there was never a pathway to righteousness. Now, with the righteousness of Jesus Christ impugned to us, we're called out of that into freedom, which is called the law of the spirit of Christ, spirit of life in Christ. Wow, that's so powerful. And for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, how does that, how do, how do we do that? How does that manifest? Look, when the love of Christ, when, when you fall in love with Jesus Christ, his love through the righteousness impugned to you comes into you with the power of the Holy Spirit. And now what we do is we don't run around like the law and condemn everyone. No, because the freedom and the grace that was extended to us, we can now look at those who are sinful. We should be able to and not condemn them and just tell them, go to hell. You deserve you made your bed, made, you know, uh, sleep in it. No, we should have the compassion, love of Christ to love your neighbors yourself. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, 20 and 21. He said this, To the Jews I became a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law, though not being without the law of God under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. Here's what he's saying. I love people. To the Jew I respected them where they were. I didn't try to condemn them. But literally, I became, I infiltrated, I loved them and became like them. I loved them. Yet, I wasn't under the law. I was under freedom, but I, but I was living by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. To those in the law, I love them as they are. To those outside of the law, I love them as they are. Right? So he's saying, love your neighbor as yourself. How do we do that? That's the question he's going to answer here. Look at what it says in verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So that was the argument. How do we live then? If it's not against the law, how do we live? This, this biting, this bickering, this arguing among them, in this freedom, in and out of this freedom. If you bite and devour one another, that's the argument that's going on. Where are the rules? How do we live, Paul? Where do we go from here? Look at what it says in verse 16. is kind of the capstone of all of this. But I say, okay, not in the law, not in total freedom. Oh, I don't have to obey any rules, regulations. But... But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. This is so, so powerful. Back to Romans. In Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 6, Paul says this, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. 
so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now look at, listen to this, Romans 8, verse, uh, verses 5 and 6. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit on the things of the Spirit. Here's what he's saying. Paul says in, in Galatians 5, verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit. Well, how do you walk? How do you set your mind? How do you how do you do this? Paul answers himself in his, in his letter to the Romans. He says, for those who are according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the Spirit. That's what he's saying. That's what he's talking about. They have set their minds on the Spirit. How do I do that? I run. I embrace just like I set my mind on the things of the flesh and desire and run after it, I will set my mind on the things of the Word of God and the things of Christ, and I will run to it. I will run to the Word. I will run to prayer. I will run to church. I will run to my uh, fall to my knees in prayer, right? I won't run to the sexually suggested movies. I won't run to the things of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, I won't medicate, I won't alter my state of consciousness, those things of the flesh, the desires, the things of the world. I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire. You will not. Paul's telling you, look, you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. You got him. You got the spirit of sonship when you became an heir. Talk to him. Cry out to him. Lean on him. He's there for you. He will be there for you. That's why he, 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 he came. Look, it is all fulfilled in the prophecy, right? Look at, look at verse 17, okay? Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. You may not do the things that you please. Why? Because you set. If you're going to walk in the flesh, it sets its desire. That's the, that's the draw of sin. That is the, that's that demonic influence that just draws your eyes to the pornography or draws your eyes to the lust of of the flesh or the monies or desires or whatever, to that new car, whatever it is, it just draws you there, right? The flesh sets its desire against the spirit. The, the flesh, if you're going to live in the flesh, if you're going to listen to the world, it's all setting its desire against the spirit of God. And the spirit against the flesh, here you go. This is what's going on the whole time. Boom, boom, boom. For these are in opposition with one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Listen to this prophecy, Jeremiah 31, 35. We talked about this in our Generations for Christ class, our, our 20s and 30-year-olds, um, last Wednesday night. We're talking about what is it? What are the proofs that you feel you have seen or heard that that make that that help you to follow Jesus Christ? In other words, what are the externals? And some said, "Well, you know, the Bible never it's it's never been um, repudiated as being false and never proven to be a false witness, and it just stood through the generations." And, and then we talked about the archaeological evidences and the manuscript evidences, right? And the Bible always confirms, archaeology always confirms the Bible. They even use the Bible to help find and determine some of the archaeological digs. Listen what the prophet Jeremiah, this was one of them too. Well, the prophets prophesied years before the Christ, and it came to pass. Listen to Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 35. Behold... The days are coming, declares the Lord. This is the prophet Jeremiah. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, 
not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. Listen, I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. In other words, rather than external an external stone of regulations and religious rules, I'm going to break that stone and I'm going to put it in their hearts. And on their heart, I will write it. In other words, Paul says, you don't want to, you don't want to, Fulfill the things of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. He's going to show us the list, the dynamics of the Spirit and the flesh coming up in Galatians. But I want you to get this today first. You have to set your mind. He's going to give you the list, but you have to set your mind. Look, I will put my law within them. And, verse 34, they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. In other words, there won't be rules, external rules, telling them do this, do that, to know the Lord. For they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Boom. When the Spirit of God comes in, He is writing His decrees, His his law, His love, His way. There is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because the spirit of life, the spirit of life in Christ is in you. But I say walk, walk, walk. Philippians, Paul also said in Philippians 2.13, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. There it is again. God's in you. I don't think you understand Some people struggle with this whole dynamic of, well, I just can't. I want to do this, but I can't. You can. You're you're still listening to the flesh. You're you're listening to the external rules. You can because the power of, of the Holy Spirit dwells in you when you are born again, whom the Son sets free. You are free indeed. You are free. You are free from the flesh that That righteousness that Christ brought from God, God took the righteousness from Adam and Eve when they sinned and he brought it back to earth through Jesus Christ and now through him, that righteousness of Christ is ours if we stay on the faith bus. Watch last week's video for that one. It was good. For it is Christ who is at work in you. Is he at work in you? Well, I don't know. I guess I must not be saved. Well, hang on. Have you set your mind to hear and to listen? Some of you say, well, I go in the Bible and I, you know, I sat down and I opened the Bible and I said, Lord, speak to me. And I did this. And the the verse said, you know, he was stoned for picking up sticks. Oh, great. Come on. You have to will. Remember, our God doesn't make robots. He makes disciples. Salvation, eternal life is all about free will that's how adam and eve were they were given god didn't create evil they were given the ability to choose free will what an amazing creative act to create humankind after his own heart and i and then give us the ability to choose and love him or not And through the help of the Holy Spirit, all we have to do now is set our minds. We have to set our minds. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Let me prophesy this over you right now from the Word of God. It is time to walk in the Spirit. If you want to get out from where you are, if you're tired of the same old thing, if you're tired of the same old stumbling blocks, if you're tired of this old man that's within you, then set your mind. It is time to walk. It is time to walk by the Spirit that is in you. For it is God who is at work in you, Philippians 2.13, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 
willing to work, you can do it. I always go back to, I I still see a lot of spiritual overtones in The Wizard of Oz. (laughs) That old classic. And, you know, that was something of my childhood. Probably not most of you because I'm an old guy. But, you know, it's like the slippers, man. She had the way home the whole time. She was wearing the slippers. You have the pathway. When you were born again, you have the pathway home to heaven through the indwelling spirit, that spirit of sonship as Paul called it in Galatians in context, right? Because you're no longer a slave. But I'm a slave to drugs or I'm a slave to alcohol. I'm a slave to anger. I'm a slave to pornography. I'm a slave to 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 jealousy. To, to Okay? But you have the Spirit of God. Set your mind against that. Let his power move through you. For it is God who is at work in you, Philippians 2.13, both to will and to work for his good. To will and to work for his good. Look, the flesh is always going to set its desire. And what does the Antichrist spirit do? The Antichrist spirit is out there in the world. We talked about the doctrines of man. They are constantly just trying to set our minds against the gospel. We were talking about this in our class Wednesday night too. Well, you know, some critics looked at this and this historically and they think, well, you know, and the Bible's not really clear. Well, you know what they're trying to do? Those are, yes, critics. That is the spirit of the flesh, the spirit of the Antichrist. And they're trying to put enough stumbling blocks in your path to get you to disbelieve. That's a spirit of of historical revisionism. They want to revive the past so they can control the narrative today. Set your mind against it. How do I do that? When the thought comes in, no. When your eyes start to look at something, look away. Set your mind. Set your mind. Look, I am not perfect, but I have set my mind to serve Christ. I've set my mind to serve Christ, and when I fall, yes, I lean on the grace of God for forgiveness. It's not a free license. Look, when you're saved, it's not just tickets to heaven. It's an overcoming life. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. It's to take the grace and compassion of God and feel that love of Christ and then be able to minister to others. Wow, how powerful is that? For the flesh, verse 16 and 17, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not be doing the things that you please. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. That is the question. I want to stop right there. If you're led by the Spirit, only you can answer that. Only I can answer it for myself. Are you led by the Spirit? In other words, are you truly born again? If you are, you have the power. You have the power. You have the power. He's talking to Christians, and I'm speaking to you today. Are you a Christian? Because if you are, you are led by the Spirit, and you are not under law. You are led. How do we do it? You've got to set your mind. You have to embrace it. I want to pray for you to, this morning that that's exactly what we'll do. Look, it's never too late. It's just time to set. It's time for a reset. Sometimes I notice this. I, I had to, uh, I had to, uh, and I, I gave this illustration once before. I, I got, I'm a ham operator, ham radio operator, technician. And I had this little handheld, it's an ICOM, and it's little buttons and can't see them. It's really hard to program. Within the default of the, of the radio, if you get it messed up and, and you program stuff and you make mistakes, you can literally press two buttons and another one, turn it off, and it will reset itself to the factory settings. In other words, you can cancel out all of the misc buttons that you pushed or the settings that you push. I noticed that for my GPS, my Garmin GPS, you can reset it back to factory settings. Here's what God is saying. If you don't know it, if you're not being led by the Spirit, 
let's push the default button and let's reset ourselves back to redeemed humanity. John, I read it earlier, John 8, 36, for if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. Let's just reset everything back to that. How do you do that? How do you push the reset buttons? Prayer. You set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, right now we push the reset button for those that are listening. We can all do it. It's not a bad thing each and every morning. Set the reset button. The reset button says if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. We confess that right now. I am free in Christ Jesus. Now, Father, we're going to set our minds on you. We're going to set our minds on you. you. You're dwelling within us. We have the power to overcome. If we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out the desire of the flesh. We just need to walk. We need to set. We need to walk by the Spirit. Holy Spirit of God from within us. By the, by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ, His finished work on the cross, move within us. Walk within us, God. Let us, let us love our neighbors as ourselves. Let us not condemn like the law, but let us be that light and salt and light, that city on a hill that can't be quenched to our neighbors, to our community. I pray that Maytown Church will be a light that shines to this community, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I pray that I'm a light that shines to the, to the county as we work on these permits. And, and, I, and I, just, I just pray that, you know, that we, the church, can be the vanguards. We can be the upfront people when it comes to righteousness and freedom and grace. Father, I love you. We praise you. For those listening, Lord, just I rededicate my life. I reset. I just push the buttons by prayer right now. I reset myself to walk in freedom. And we do that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen, amen, amen. God is good. There's more here. I, uh, but I want to just, I wanted to get the reset first. Paul's going to move on. He's going to give us lists, man. You're going to see this. It's going to be powerful. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Amen, amen. Hey, pastors, look at this. I just noticed I got this big old... Iced Americano, sugar-free chocolate. It's Pastor's Appreciation Month. Last Sunday, I wanted to thank all of those that came, and they appreciated us, pastors, and we had a fun time. And so I'm appreciating myself today. I got some free coffee coupons for Avenue, got me a big old 20-ounce free iced Americano, and I'm appreciating it this morning. I even brought it with me into the pulpit. Amen? Amen. Look, I pray that you're free. Go to MaytownAG.com. You can find out more about us there. Uh, if you have questions, you can give there to uh, your tithes offerings. If you want to join us in, their, in our one-year pledge, we've asked people to consider praying about a one-year pledge of an extra amount to our building fund, October through October 25. And many have responded. I think we're close to $2,800 um, pledged in, in extra of their tithes and their offerings. Let's don't forget our missionaries. Um, and uh, let's prepare ourselves for just the greatest. We're election time. We're close to the election. We're not afraid. We have the power of God. It's going to be a great year. We're going to build and um, we're going to see souls, like it says, set free because when the sun sets them free, they're free indeed. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in.